okay? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this first Sunday in April. As spring teases us with glimmers of hope and then retreats just as quickly as it arrived, we come together this morning anticipating Easter with all its sorrow and hope. Life is messy. It's full of wonder and joy as the sun reminds us of the warmth of God's love. And yet, when we look at the blue light of our phone screens and scroll through the murky mire of people's lives, we ache for a suffering world. A world that can feel cold and barren and devoid of goodness. This morning, we are going to explore the familiar story from John's Gospel, The Raising of Lazarus. Though we've read the story before of Lazarus's miraculous rising from the grave, I would like to encourage you this morning to park your familiarity with this tale. It is a messy one. It is a story steeped in sorrow and heartache. It is a moment in time recorded for us when Jesus wept tears of sorrow and deep grief. Before we get to the joy, I would invite us all this morning to sit with this reality in order to hear, um, to help us hear the remarkable, the radical words of Jesus afresh. I am the resurrection the truth, and the life. Please join with me now in our call to worship by reading the words in bold on the screen. God calls us to worship, and we come, some with laughter and songs of joy. God calls us to worship, and we come, some with a sense of obligation, or habit. God calls us to worship and we come, some with hearts heavy with grief. God calls us to worship and we come, some with distraction or exhaustion. God calls us to worship and we come, some with eagerness and enthusiasm. God calls us to worship and we come, some with stress, loneliness, or depression. As God's dearly loved children, we bring all our joy and pain, hurt and hope into this place of spirit-given grace, love, and hope. Stand with us now in our call to worship, our opening praise, sorry, um, God of grace, amazing wonder.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you came to serve. As you came to a blind man and gave him sight, come to us in our darkness and show us the things we cannot see. As you came to a man tormented in his mind and gave him peace and healing, come to us in our tensions and make us whole. As you came to Lazarus who was dead and brought him from the grave, come to us in our deadness and bring us to real life now with our living Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, you came not to be served, but to serve, but we see life the other way around. To get where we do not give, to exploit whom we have not helped, to use what we have not earned. As you came to a dying thief and promised him paradise, come to us now in forgiveness and give us hope. In your name, Lord. We pray. Amen. And so in the light of that hope, uh, this morning let us stand and sing with joy. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. everybody. This week uh, Paul and I had the opportunity to sit down with a very special couple. Uh, Annas and Olga Nell uh, have lived and worked in Northern Ireland for a number of years. Uh, Annas is from South Africa uh, and Olga is from Russia. And currently they are working in the Christian University in St. Petersburg. Uh, Annas teaching theology uh, and Olga in translation work. Uh, they were back in Northern Ireland. They have been back in Northern Ireland for a few weeks. and We got the opportunity to chat to them about their work uh, and also about the continuing situation uh, as it affects them in Russia at the moment. Uh, so we thought you'd like to share in some of that chat. And so here's uh, a little bit of me speaking to Anas and Olga. Tell us a little bit about what uh, what you do in, in St. Petersburg and uh, the church that you're part of there as well. <laughs> um, we are teaching at the Christian University in St. Petersburg. Um, it is a, a, a Protestant uh, training center for pastors, for Christian leaders and so on. It's been there since um, 1990, just mm -hmm. after the fall of communism. So it's the oldest and most established uh, training center for Protestant 
uh, believer. Now, Protestant, you know, is just <laughs> very, very wide <laughs> here as well, very broad yeah. concept, and it's the same in Russia. Um, so uh, I'm teaching mostly practical theology. Uh, I was supposed to teach systematic theology. I do it in English, and my wife has the ability, you know, very <laughs> good ability to speak Russian, so <laughs> she's teaching. Uh, she's actually teaching. Uh, okay. I, I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just saying the English, and then uh, she normally corrects me a little yes. bit and so on. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the situation uh, in the Protestant education in Russia that most of the churches were founded after Perestroika, so they are quite few. Okay. And um, people didn't have education when they took over after missionaries left Russia. Mm. Uh, so now it's really important to educate pastors in Russia. Yeah. Um, and so Anas um, came to teach systematic theology, but then uh, the university said no, but we have nobody teaching in practical theology because there is not one book in Russian in practical theology. So Anna's developed the courses in practical theology and now he wrote the first study book in practical theology, which I still need to translate. Okay. It's a huge <laughs> job in front. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, it's really helpful for the churches there. That's mm -hmm. our, our biggest challenge now is the translation of the material. Yes. Um, it's m much of it has been translated roughly, you know, but uh, mm -hmm. but the book now it's a, it's a big very big project yeah. and we uh, after Olga translates that it needs to be edited and okay. yes. Hopefully be published uh, by next year so that will be the first thing in in that field. So the first practical theology book in Russian. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Well, can you tell us a little bit about um, how things have changed for you over the last, maybe over the last number of years, but over the last couple of months, particularly in Russia? Over uh, the last couple of years, it also changed a lot yeah, 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 <laughs> because yeah, yeah. we we were, uh, you know, we had to adapt to a new uh, church culture. Yeah. Uh, because Olga, uh, uh, you know, became a Christian basically in, in Southern Africa and okay. in Northern Ireland. So she didn't know any of the church culture. Yes, okay. when we came back, it was all new for us. We okay. need to learn the context. Okay. Um, and I didn't even know the terms in uh, Russian, you know, Christian terms. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a challenge yeah. at the beginning. But over the last mm -hmm months or, th or so things have changed uh, radically. We never expected uh, something like this to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the churches this is mm -hmm. extremely challenging um, mm -hmm. because we, we're trying to be a witness yes. in, in the community mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of things that, that we do, but the the churches, uh, you know, cannot speak out much mm -hmm. uh, in, in a situation like this. Protestant churches in general would be uh, a little bit under pressure uh, because the main church is the Orthodox Church. So uh, the, the Protestant churches are not allowed to evangelize or, or so. Uh, so they would be more careful as well. They need a license, you know, to to uh, uh, practice uh, and, and so on. So they would be, so the prophetic task of the church you mm. know, to speak out mm. is not really possible uh, okay. in a situation like this. So certain, we, we need to avoid some certain language mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. On a practical level, um, financially, it it changed a lot. Yeah, it's yeah. very hard now, very hard financially. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. because uh, uh, all the the you know Swift yeah. has yes. been cancelled, Mastercard, yeah. uh, and so on. So, the people in Russia they yeah. still get their their money in yes. rubles, so yes. that's okay. But mm -hmm. it, maybe you can say something about the. Um, oh no, the prices, the prices have gone up. I was mm. in the shop and uh, they said. Guys, whatever you see, the price is there, they are not <laughs> actual now. When you pay, you know them, you will know how much it okay. costs. So okay. it changes every 
our the normal okay. prices. Okay. And okay. You can't find some foods in the shops like sugar disappeared or mm -hmm. salt or mm -hmm. something like mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. some things just uh, not only double but five times more. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it's. I feel sorry for yeah. <laughs> for the, the people, people because we lived through perestroika <laughs> when it was chaos when yes. it was all destroyed and um, it was hunger um, and yeah. now I'm just yeah. yeah it's a real practical economic challenges yeah, yeah the yeah. the yeah. Mm -hmm. older people with their pensions you know mm -hmm. uh, is now basically yeah. forty percent yeah. less in value uh, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, of but course, it's nothing compared to what's going on on the other yes. side. We sure. should say that, sure. that we understand mm -hmm. that, sure. and we pray. Yeah. You know, but um, yeah, I also yeah. feel sorry for my people as well. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. I suppose I should ask because obviously, Anas, you're from South Africa. Olga, you're Russian. Mm -hmm. I suppose one of the things I should ask is how you two met. <laughs> <laughs> And we say Olga looked for me, you know. Okay. <laughs> we we uh, our churches uh, were involved in uh, supporting missionaries uh, in Russia many uh, a few decades ago, mm -hmm. and uh, and um, someone committed fraud on my credit card uh, yeah. in a specific company, a tour company there, and then Olga was employed. I got a job because of that. Okay. <laughs> so when we arrived at the the the, the uh, place where we stayed, uh, she was looking for me all the time. Okay. You know because the director of the company wanted to speak to me, so okay. that's why I say she always looked <laughs> for me. <laughs> you know, she. So that's where we met, and then later on, uh, Olga also became involved with uh, helping us with church groups coming. Okay. So. Yeah. So you're really thankful to that person who defrauded your... Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm quite thankful. I'm not sure about Olga. <laughs> but we had good, uh, you know, we lived in Namibia, then we lived in South Africa, and then we came here to Northern Ireland. Okay. okay. So um, tell us then, as you think about going back to uh, St. Petersburg at the end of April, um, how can we pray for you? Yeah, I think uh, Olga can uh, also say, but I think for the church, for the church in in Russia, you know, to to remain faithful uh, mm -hmm. to the gospel at at this stage, and specifically to be able to support each other, you know, uh, pastorally support each other in situations like this. Some uh, people in churches lost their businesses, mm -hmm. lost their their life, livelihood. They can, you cannot find new jobs as well mm. because there are no jobs. So on that level, uh, the church plays a huge role, mm. you know, to, to get the community of believers together. Our minister in our church said the last few Sundays is record, actually the record attendance. Okay. And people are praying, mm. really praying now. So, uh, for the university, uh, you know, that we would continue uh, with our work. Uh, the university uh, didn't stop working, you know, so mm -hmm. we, we just continue. But emotionally, mm -hmm. it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, some of our students yeah. asked, could you, could you please give us just extension on when we should mm -hmm. uh, submit our, mm -hmm. our stuff? We, we cannot concentrate. Mm -hmm. That's how it is at the moment. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> financially, maybe for for our yes. staff. Yes. For uh, because just to give you an example, two hundred and fifty pounds a month is more or less the salary okay. of our colleagues. Mm. Now you can imagine now with yeah. the exchange rate that it's much less. So just how, we we don't know how they survive in any case, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and now it's even mm -hmm. more difficult, okay. and uh, the students as well. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for sharing. I mean, Olivia, you wanted to say something as well. Uh, just in these dark times, that the church in both countries would be the light, light. would show the light, yeah. uh, because God also works powerfully during troubles, during hard times. 
So and also for the unity of Christians, mm. you know, all the borders, mm. uh, supporting each other and just being the light for the world. Absolutely, I think that's a really good good note to yeah. finish on. That idea that as we're we are brothers and sisters in yes. Christ, yes, mm. wherever we come from and whatever yeah. side of the border we yeah. we are on. Uh, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, both of you. I know we'll be praying later on in the service for mm -hmm. uh, for you and for the, the, the and we're continuing to pray for the situation in um, yeah. Russia and Ukraine over these days. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. So as Olga said at the end, there the prayer is that the light would continue to shine out through the church in Russia and in Ukraine. Uh, so we're going to stand together and sing, Lord, the light of your love is shining. Shine, Jesus, shine. Our scripture reading this morning comes from John's Gospel, John chapter 11, verses 1 to 44. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, 
the village of Mary and his sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you and yet you're going back. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When, Mar when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more moved, came to the tomb. 
It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you are always, uh, that you always hear me. But I say this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Amen. Good morning. There is so much that is extraordinary about the passage Emma's just read to us. But most extraordinary of all, I think, more extraordinary even than the sight of the dead man walking, are the words spoken by Jesus to the grieving and heartbroken Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. These words are so familiar to us that we easily miss the gravity of what Jesus is claiming here. But when we stop to think for a moment, we're quickly overwhelmed by the seeming incomprehensibility of these words. What can Jesus mean with all this talk about believing and living, about dying and not dying? How are we to believe that he truly is the Lord of life as we've been considering all these weeks in John's gospel when the reality remains that he allows people to yet die? Faced with these questions, we can understand why Jesus follows these words with a question of his own. Do you believe this? That's the question to ask, isn't it? Do you believe this, Martha? Even now, when your brother is in the tomb, do you believe that I am? Because it's one thing to believe when the spring sun is shining like today and the daffodils are coming into bloom. But Jesus asks this question in the valley of death. And in that place, it takes on a different weight. Do you believe, Martha, even now? Friends, I feel I have to admit to you today that I have felt the weight of that question this past week. As some of you will know, a young man from our home congregation died very suddenly just a couple of weeks ago. Daniel was a beautiful, kind, and a brilliant young man. He brought happiness and joy to so many people. And I know that includes some of our young people at Kirkpatrick who went to school with him. Death is so difficult to accept at any age. But the death of one so young and one so full of life is hardest of all to comprehend. It leaves us feeling shaken and confused. It confronts us with the cruel reality of death, that life is so, so fragile, and that to lose someone we love is so final, so absolute. And yet into this dark valley, God moves in. Jesus comes to be with Martha, we read, in her grief. And he stands before her in the same mortal frame as hers. 
The same flesh as hers, and he declares, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? There's so much in these 44 verses, as I've said, that we could explore today, but in the light of the week that has just been, it's this question of belief that I want us to focus on. What does it mean to believe these words of Jesus? What difference does belief in Jesus make when confronted with the reality of death? And what does belief look like when the gravity of death pulls us down? I think to answer these questions, we need to consider this last I am saying of Jesus in its context. Because though Easter cards and religious merchandise would emblazon these words against quaint backdrops of spring lambs and blooming meadows, John has none of that sentimentality in his gospel. Instead, he holds these words of Christ up to the ugly reality of death. And by doing so, he disavows those cynics of our faith who regard all this Christianity stuff as some emotional crutch for those who cannot face reality. Perfectly harmless, they'll say, but not at all realistic. Just sentimental claptrap. But that's not what I see here in John's gospel. Not at all. Death is not sugar-coated by John. Instead, we are assaulted, aren't we, by the putrid smell of Lazarus's decaying flesh. Martha, even after saying she believes, doesn't want that stone to be removed because the odor will be too strong. You know, today, we've professionalized death to the extent that we're spared such indelicacies. But in John's day, death was not so easy to manage. It was common, it was ugly. And he does not shy away from this ugliness in his gospel. Jesus in this passage speaks plain words to the disciples. Lazarus is dead. You know, I think in our society, well, we no longer know how to talk about death in such honest terms. Just yesterday, and I wasn't just writing my sermon yesterday, but just yesterday, I noticed an article in the Belfast Telegraph about this very thing. The columnist, Emer McGovern, was reflecting on the recent death of her father-in-law, which she explained has caused her family to confront their own reluctance to talk about death. As part of her discussion, she referred to a recent study, which in her words, found that our brains do their best to keep us from thinking about death and try to shield us from existential fear by categorizing death as an unfortunate event that only befalls other people. We're so unused to talking about death that we tell, us, tell ourselves that it's an unfortunate event that only befalls other people. Part of the reason for this death denial must surely be the extraordinary advances in health and medical science, which is a wonderful thing. But it does lead us to struggle to talk about death. I mean, I heard one doctor say to me recently that medicine has advanced so much that death could now be understood as a medical failure. But death is not a medical failure. It's a fact of life. Death is not something that befalls other people. From dust we all are, and to dust we shall all return. This culture of death denial means that our society, absent religious belief, is ill-equipped to deal with death. And comfort is found, ironically, in sentimental ritual and groundless platitudes. I'm thinking here of a poem I used to read with my students called Long Distance by an atheist poet, Tony Harrison. The poem describes how Harrison's father used to warm his mother's slippers long after her death. And he used to put a hot water bottle her side of the bed 
much to the poet's derision. But in the last few lines of the poem, Harrison admits something. He admits that after his father died, he found himself adopting the same sentimental rituals. Here's how it ends. I believe life ends with death, and that is all. You haven't both gone shopping. Just the same, in my new black leather phone book, there's your name and the disconnected number I still call. And we Christians are accused of denying reality. See, when I read John 11, I don't see any sentimentality or empty platitudes. Instead, by his words and actions, Jesus faces up to the harsh facts of illness, death, and disconnection in our world. And just as importantly, he acknowledges the reality of loss, grief, and anger while trusting that they will not and do not have the last word. Let's not forget as we look at these words and as Jesus encounters death in this passage that he loved the one who died. He loved Lazarus. The passage begins with this message, Lord, the one you love is sick. And that love is demonstrated in the most raw and honest way when Jesus weeps. Jesus, the author of life himself, the one who's about to resuscitate Lazarus, still weeps at his death. More than that, John tells us, as Emma read, he's greatly disturbed. The Greek word here conveys this emotive expression of anger and distress. You know, when I was growing up, my granny used to say to me, Christians should weep at a birth and laugh at a death. With all respect to my granny, what nonsense. In Jesus Christ, we see the very opposite. A God who rejoices in life and who weeps at death. Death grieves God. Death is the great enemy of God, and it's death that Jesus came to destroy. This week marked the death date of the great poet and dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, John Donne, one of my heroes. It's fair to say John Donne was preoccupied by death, which is maybe understandable given that he lived in London during time of plague. One of the most famous poems of his is a sonnet that begins with these words. Death, be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. John Donne here is picking a fight with death. And he can do that because his poem ends with this powerful declaration of our hope in Christ. One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. Believing that Jesus is the resurrection and the life does not spare us from grief. Jesus himself wept. But believing in Jesus allows us to grieve in the knowledge that death does not have the last word. You know, at Tuesday's Thanksgiving service for Daniel, his father read a touching tribute to his son, and he told us how Daniel used to keep journals, where he would write down memorable lines from books he was reading or films he had watched. The very last entry in Daniel's journal was a, a quotation from a Marvel character called Vision. Here's what he said. What is grief if not love persevering? What is grief if not love persevering? You know, as I thought about those words in relation to John 11 this week, it struck me that it's in Christ that love perseveres. This is what it means to believe that He is the resurrection and the life. To believe is to persevere in His love and to trust in Him. 
we don't just believe the truth of what Jesus says. We believe in him. We put our trust and our love in him. And you see, this relationship of love and trust, it can't be destroyed by physical death. Paul tells us this in Romans, doesn't he? There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God, not even death. But this does not mean that we are spared physical death or grief or danger or suffering in this life. No, I think actually as followers of Jesus, we should expect to feel those things even more deeply. Why? Because Jesus felt them. He walked towards them for our sake. And we're called to follow him, aren't we? See, we're not spared these things. But when we're in that relationship of love and trust with Jesus, we can be sure that he will sustain us and lead us as a shepherd leads his sheep. I think that's what Jesus means with those hard to understand words he speaks to Martha. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. You see, I think he's describing here how life lived with him is not defined or dominated by death. It is a death transcending life. A life lived in relationship with him. And in this relationship, death is no longer the full stop or even the worst thing that can happen to us. In fact, a life lived with Jesus means that death, sometimes, as it was for Martha in this story, be an opportunity for deeper faith. The theologian David Ford has a wonderful phrase for this. He calls this Jesus-centered realism. I really like that phrase, Jesus-centered realism. His point is that physical death is not is, is not ignored, but is relativized by Jesus, brought into perspective by him who is the resurrection and the life. In the light of Jesus, he writes, there is a distinction between the ordinary sense of life, life together that ends with death, and the eternal life, this extraordinary life of the one who says, I am. Yet this distinction is by no means a separation. Rather, Jesus fully affirms ordinary life and weeps over ordinary death, even becoming angry at death and the cost of experiencing it. You see, as Ford goes on to explain, what Jesus offers us in this life is full immersion in ordinary life and full exposure to ordinary death but with the confidence of resurrection and a quality of life, love, and relationship with him that begins now this side of the grave, but which is not limited to it. This is the realism we find in Jesus, God made flesh. In his person, we find both the ordinary and the extraordinary together. And this Ordinary, extraordinary, as David Ford calls it, is available to anyone who responds to him in trust and who lives and believes in him. This is what Jesus is enabling Martha to understand with that question, do you believe this? What he's really asking here is, do you believe in me, Martha? Do you love me, Martha? Do you trust me. You see, John 11 tells us that belief in Jesus is less about intellectual assent and theological understanding and more to do with a loving trust in the person of Christ. The resurrection and the life in Jesus are not some abstract, airy-fairy concepts that float above our lived experience. They're divine realities that are embodied, made concrete in the person of Christ who became sin and death that we might live. So, how then are we 
to live? What should this life look like for us? Well, let me finish this sermon by suggesting just one way we might go from here to be Christ's resurrection people, extending his life to a world held hostage by death. And to do that, I want to turn your, point your attention once again to that moment that Emma read to us when Jesus cries out in a loud voice and he calls to Lazarus from the tomb. That dramatic scene when his glory is revealed in this unprecedented reversal of death. Jesus cries out in that loud, loud voice and like a, a sheep hearing the shepherd's voice, Lazarus responds. But I wonder, did you notice something as Emma read? Lazarus comes out from the tomb, doesn't he? But he's not yet free, not completely. His hands and his feet are still bound by the grave linen. Now, when we get to John 20 at Easter time, we will discover that this is not the case for Jesus. When Peter looks into that empty tomb, he finds the linen lying on the spot where Jesus' body lay. Why is this? Well, it's because the raising of Christ is not the same as the raising of Lazarus. Jesus is resurrected on that Sunday morning. He rises as the first fruit of the new creation. But Lazarus, Lazarus is only resuscitated. His death has only been temporarily delayed. This is why when he comes out of the tomb, still bound by the rags of death, Jesus calls to his disciples and says, untie him, let him go free. Friends, today I want to suggest to you that this instruction for the 12 to untie Lazarus should be taken as a call to love and action for all disciples of Christ. Because while we have heard the shepherd's voice, while we, he has given us life in abundance, we still live in a fallen world. And the rags of death can still ensnare us. We've heard as much this morning from Annas and Olga and we see it on our news screens every evening. Into this dark world, Jesus sends us to be his liberators, to untie the bonds of grief, of loneliness, addiction, debt, or sectarianism, or whatever else might hinder us from living the life Jesus died so we could live. We are to be salt to stop the decay, and light to cast out the darkness. So how are you going to live today? How are you going to act? What is it that God wants you to do in His name? Whatever it is, believe that Jesus goes with you and before you. And whatever the cost may seem, remember that His is the way, the resurrection, and the life. Let us pray together. Our Lord Jesus Christ, you have conquered death by becoming death for us. Father, help us to live lives worthy of such a cost. Even as we go from this place today, show us the ways we can go and be your agents of life. Show us the practical things we can do to respond to your call for love and action in this world, in our home, in this congregation, and in the whole world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul. Just wanted to share with you some of our plans for Holy Week as part of our announcements and also for your, your prayers as we move towards Easter time. Uh, we will be having a, a number of services and on, on Palm Sunday we'll be having our normal uh, Sunday morning two services. Um, and um, on Palm Sunday afternoon though we're going to do something a bit different and Mary Rose is going to come and explain what's going to be happening on Palm Sunday afternoon. Mary Rose.
This year, we are providing an extra service over the Easter period. Next Sunday, Palm Sunday, there will be an afternoon accessible service at 3 p.m. here in the sanctuary of the church. This service is primarily for all those who find it difficult perhaps to get to church on a Sunday morning or have not been to church for a while for whatever reason. The service will last approximately half an hour and will include a short celebration of the Lord's Supper. Light refreshments will also be served in the pews at the end of the service. Friends and family are all welcome, and if anyone might need a lift, they can contact myself or the church office. And there, is, there are some yellow cards at the back of the um, church in the vestibule if you'd like more information to take away with you. Thank you. Mary Rose. Also continuing throughout uh, this time are lunchtime liturgies. So the last two are coming up in the next couple of weeks on Wednesday lunchtimes. We would encourage you to be part of that. Take time to reflect as we approach Easter time. Uh, then in Holy Week itself, uh, the th on Thursday evening of Holy Week at 8 o'clock, we'll be having a communion service here in the church. Uh, and on Good Friday, uh, it's an invitational service. We'd encourage you to invite friends to come along to our service on Good Friday evening as we focus on the cross and as we draw people into the one uh, who said, I am the resurrection and the life and who gave his life that we might live. So we're looking at that on Good Friday uh, evening at 8 p.m. as well. Uh, Easter Sunday morning then, um, uh, we're planning to have a dawn service. Those plans are slightly uh, altered because Craig Glen, where that normally takes place, is undergoing work to one of its bridges, uh, and the bridges are or the bridge is closed. So we'll investigate that and we'll let you know where the dawn service will take place. But Easter Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, please note this, at 11 o'clock we will have one morning service uh, here in the church uh, and that will be the pattern from then on. So we're coming back to one morning service together, 11 o'clock on Easter Sunday. Uh, it's, uh, it's such a lovely Sunday to be able to make that change and to bring people back together again. And uh, we'll remind you of, of any uh, restrictions that continue to apply with regards to COVID, but we're really looking forward to Easter Sunday morning being together again uh, as one church family at 11 o'clock. Uh, on Saturday the 9th of April, uh, then just this Saturday coming as part of this uh, new approach to Lent, uh, a walk up Sleeve Donard has been organised by Gareth Walls. That's leaving from Donard Car Park, Sleeve Donard Car Park, at 7 a.m. Uh, if anyone needs a lift, the cars will leave SD Bell's Car Park at 6.15 a.m. Uh, and I know, that, uh, I know that a number of people took advantage of the Cave Hill Walk uh, on the Sunday at the beginning of Lent. I hope the folks will join in with the Sleeve Donard Walk as well. Another new approach to Easter uh, is that you might have noticed when you came into the building, there's some mesh sort of uh, gathered around the, the cross. So on Easter Sunday, what we're encouraging you to do as you come to church, uh, if you can bring a, a cut flower, either from your garden or from an arrangement, and you can bring that with you and you can place that in the mesh as you come into church on Easter Sunday morning. It's a way of demonstrating this idea that new life comes from the death of Jesus upon the cross. And it's a lovely way to be able to show that reality to our community. You'll be reminded of that in the weekly update as well. But I encourage you to do that and encourage your, your children to do that as well and participate in that. Also, just a reminder, there's a new Zoom prayer time uh, beginning this week, 10 o'clock on Tuesday nights. Um, so those of you who don't relish getting up at 7 o'clock on a Friday morning, 10 o'clock on Tuesday nights, there's another opportunity to gather together in prayer on Zoom, and the link is the same, and it's in the, the update. Uh, also, just to say, uh, on a personal note, that the Kennedys are moving up to Belfast, uh, and uh, the moving date is this Friday, the 8th. So uh, you'll accept my apologies if I'm not around an awful lot this week as we do all of that moving around. Uh, but I want to thank everyone who's helped us uh, to get the house ready, uh, in particular uh, Billy and Dan. You can now spend some more time in your own houses. So um, thank you for all of that work. 
We've already heard uh, from Anas and Olga this morning. Before we turn to our prayers for others, there's another short video um, from their pastor in St. Petersburg. His name is Hansi. Like Anas, he's also South African, but he shares with us some of the general picture of the work of the church. It's a wonderful privilege for me to just in a few minutes share with you how we are experiencing the situation we are in here in Russia. Uh, as you can hear from my accent, um, I'm South African. My name is Hansi and I was sent to Russia as a missionary in 1996 and I've been living here ever since. And for the last 13 years we've been living in St. Petersburg where Anas and Olga have been uh, serving with us. And they are just such a huge blessing to our church and to the university here in our city. Um, we just want to thank you for praying for us. Um, it has not been an easy time uh, for us here. Uh, we, no one expected this to happen. No one thought that this was actually going to take place. All of us have friends and family uh, on the other side in Ukraine. And you've seen on the news how they have been going through terrible suffering. On this side, um, Mostly, we are going through economical difficulties. Uh, it is very difficult, for example, at the moment uh, to, to travel. It's very difficult to, well, it's impossible to buy anything via the internet on, from other countries uh, because um, SWIFT doesn't work here, the banking system. Uh, we don't have, for example, at the moment, white paper. There's a shortage in the country. Um, no car parts for foreign cars, uh, some medicines. Um, everything has become so expensive. Um, some people have lost their jobs, and those who still have their jobs, their salaries are the same, but prices have gone up. So it's not an easy time, but I think emotionally a lot of people have been suffering just because of the pressure we are experiencing as well. Uh, but saying that it's nothing in comparison to our neighbors in Ukraine who have lost their homes and have fled for their lives. And that is actually what I want to ask you to pray for with us, is that um, there will be unity amongst the churches. Unfortunately, uh, some churches in the Ukraine have accused the Russian church for not doing enough during these times. Um, and we understand that they are going through tremendous, tremendous trauma and pain, and we just pray, and we are fasting as a church as well, that this bloodshed will end, and that there will be unity amongst the churches. Uh, for us here, uh, we are actually quite encouraged uh, by just what the Lord is doing in our meetings at the moment. Um, we are praying like never before, um, we are sensing, a, we have a wonderful sense of God's presence with us in our meetings. And we had a huge number of people attending our meeting on last Sunday. And we pray that today will be, there will be even more. Uh, people are being saved. Uh, one lady was delivered last week. And so the Lord is just doing something very special amongst us at the moment. We are very encouraged in that sense. And we want to ask you to pray with us that the church will be equipped during this time to really preach the gospel of Jesus uh, in these troubled times. That's for the church here in Russia and for the church in Ukraine, that many people will be saved during this time. Sometimes, you know, we want this all to end as quickly as possible, and we're praying for that. But we know that God can use these times to... Um, bring in the harvest like never before. And so we as a church, we want to be ready for that, that we will move with the Lord during this time. So please pray for that with us. Um, thank you again, and may you have a wonderful service today. God bless you. Bye-bye. Please join with me in our prayers for others. Father God, 
We bring before you Hansi, Annas and Olga this morning. The situation between Ukraine and Russia is a terrifying and messy one. We remember this morning all those caught up in this cruel conflict. For those in Russia suffering economical, emotional and physical hardship, we ask that you will be with them. As communication with the rest of the world dwindles and the country continues to spiral under Putin's reign, we ask that you would intervene to stop what is happening. In Ukraine, the suffering and terror is more than many of us can imagine. We pray for the people who are caught up in the conflict, who fear for their lives and their loved ones. We pray for those who have lost family and friends and who are fleeing. For those who, are, who have uh, chosen to stay or have no other option, Father, we ask this morning that you would be with them in their fear and trembling. May they know your love and peace in the midst of the chaos. We echo Olga's words and ask you to enable your church in both countries to be a light in the darkness. May they be empowered by you to work powerfully and in unity, despite difference and hurt, conducting themselves in a way that honours you. God of the whole world, we know that the current conflict on our screens is not the only place that is in turmoil today. We bring before you the many nations that have endured rumbling conflict over recent years and even decades. It is so easy to forget places that feel far away or feel very different from our own. We pause to think of Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Yemen, Mexico, South Sudan, Syria. For all these places and the many other nations I have failed to mention, may those wielding weapons and striving for power cease. May the hope and love that Christ offers be heard and seen and claimed. Finally, Father, as we reflect on Lazarus's emergence from the grave, we ask that you would help all of us to unwrap ourselves from the things that bind and unshackle us in our lives. Help us to loose the trappings of anxiety, of stress and greed and selfish pride and instead reclaim Christ's way again today. In your holy and precious name. Amen. I'd invite you to stand uh, for our final praise this morning as we prepare for the week that lies ahead. Great is the darkness that covers the earth.
May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.